Okay, good evening everyone, no soy fa, and welcome to the next in the anniversary talks celebrating the long and very distinguished history of Glamorgan County Cricket Club. This evening we are focusing on the 1940s and the 1950s and in particular I'm delighted this evening that we have been joined by many of the sons and daughters of some of the great names of Glamorgan cricket from this era. I'm delighted that we've actually got the five children of Wilf Wooler. I'm not quite sure what the collective noun for a group of Woolers is, maybe that's everyone's homework, but uh, I'm delighted that joining us this evening are daughters Jackie and Penny, as well as sons John, Brian, and Nick. Also, it's a great pleasure as well to see Stephen Hedges, the son of the legendary Glamorgan opening batsman Bernard Hedges, as well as Tony Davis, joining us once again, the son of Hayden Davis, the legendary Glamorgan wicketkeeper. We've also got with us this evening Mark Shepherd, the son of Glamorgan's greatest ever Bowler, Don Shepherd, man who really needs no introduction with over 2,000 first class wickets to his name. And also another Glamorgan legend, the batting legend, Alan Jones, will be with us. And Alan will be featuring towards the end of tonight's presentation, talking about his early days in the Glamorgan team. I'm also delighted once again that we've been joined by Gerard Elias, the president of Glamorgan County Cricket Club, and also with us this evening on the call are other members of the Glamorgan board and also a number of other past players and lifetime supporters of this wonderful cricket club. Well, the first talk, as I said, featured Glamorgan in the 1920s and the 1930s. And this evening, uh, I hope uh, you, you will be able to see this presentation. If I could just ask Stephen Hedges to put his thumb up uh, or thumb down, great. Uh, so uh, this evening, we are going to be highlighting, as I said, the 1940s and the 1950s. And what I have uh, for you this evening, once the uh, technology works, is a presentation looking at these wonderful years. If I just uh, press the right button and we should be uh, underway. In fact, what I'll do is I'll just start that again. So, as I said, we're looking this evening at the 1940s and the 1950s, and we can see in the first of this evening's slides, we can see the great Glamorgan team of 1948, led by the legendary Wilf Wooler there on the extreme left. Well, that team, as I said, won the county championship in 1948, and probably not many people would have thought when want, the team regrouped <coughs> in 1946 that within a couple of years they would be county champions. Indeed, Glamorgan had suffered during the 1940s. They'd, like every other 
county cricket team. They had organised a series of uh, fundraising matches to raise money for the various wartime charities. We can see on the screen a scorecard for a game at Cardiff Arms Park in May 1944 against a British Empire 11. It wasn't there were full <coughs> Glamorgan team because many of the Glamorgan players from before the war were fighting for king and country. And in particular, one man in particular, who we encountered in the talk a few weeks ago, Morris Turnbull, the man who had helped Glamorgan turn the corner in the 1930s. He was sadly killed in action in 1944 in Normandy. And the following year in 1945, a series of memorial games were staged by Glamorgan in the memory of that wonderful man. So Glamorgan looking to build on those very firm foundations that Morris had created during the 1930s. And when Glamorgan regrouped in 1946, it was Johnny Clay, Morris's great friend, who led <coughs> Glamorgan and helped the club to start up once again. We can see in this photo from 1946 that there were several other members of the Glamorgan playing squad from before the war who were still around. In the back row, far left, Alan Watkins, who had made his debut before the war and had served with the Royal Navy. Next to Alan, second from the left in the back row, Willie Jones, Willie Bach from Carmarthen, who also had been one of the young players to cut their teeth during the 1930s. We can see second from the right on the back row, a man we're going to be hearing an awful lot more about later on, the wicketkeeper, <coughs> the great wicketkeeper, Hayden Davis. On the front row, we can see Arnold Dyson, the uh, legendary opening batsman, that's Arnold far left, and his opening partner on the extreme right, you can see Emerus Davis. Next to Emerus, so second right on the front row, Austin Matthews, who had also played for Glamorgan in the 1930s, had also played for England in the 1937 series against New Zealand. Austin was now a coach and helping to groom the new generation of Glamorgan cricketers. But there's one man in that photo without whom Glamorgan cricket would have struggled. Of course, I'm talking literally, quite literally, about Johnny Clay's right-hand man in that photo. Of course, it is the one and only Wilfred Wooler. And as I said at the start, I'm really delighted that this evening, all five of Wilf's children are joining us this evening to talk to us about this great and wonderful all-round sportsman. So before we actually look at Wilf's achievements with Glamorgan, let's start off with a little bit of background about this legendary figure, not just in Glamorgan cricket, but this legendary figure in Welsh sport. So we're going to start up in North Wales, where Wilf originated. This is a delightful postcard from the 1920s of Colwyn Bay, the Rose on Sea ground, just a stone's throw from the seafront in Colwyn Bay and Rose on Sea. And it was where Wilf was brought up. I think Brian, Brian Wooler, Wilf's son, is just going to share a few words with us about uh, Wilf's early days. Yes, Andrew, I, 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 thank you. Uh, we used to go up uh, to uh, Colwyn Bay every year to stay with Dad's father, who we call Grandpa. Um, and in fact, in this picture up in the top left, you can actually, I think, see the house that 
they used to live in, but when we knew them, they'd already moved on to uh, the water the uh, the seafront uh, to a house called Cobblecote. Um, Grandpa was a builder, and uh, I think in true Buller fashion, uh, all the extensions he built, and I'm not sure he ever asked permission. I think he just did it. So uh, that, that's where we used to go and visit. Um, we used to travel up once a year, um, and I'm pretty sure it was probably around the time Glamorgan used to go up and play there once uh, once a year in, in the in the ground. Um, Dad and uh, uh, Dad's father, uh, Pop, and, and Dad's grandfather, they were all key parts of the Colwyn Bay uh, Cricket Club. Um, we used to go up there and see the other ones. Dad was Dad was a, from a family of uh, four uh, four other boys, Uncle Roy to us, Uncle Jack and Uncle Peter, and Uncle Gordon we never met. He was killed in the war. He was, I think, he was a fighter pilot. Um, that we used to enjoy going up there. Um, five of us in the car uh, when Johnny was there as a little baby. The four of us sitting in the bench seat at the back, no seatbelts in those days, driving up through North Wales through the Horseshoe Pass. We used to love going up there, and of course everybody everybody knew Dad. Uh, and that's uh, that we used to enjoy uh, living uh, our vicarious uh, fortunes uh, from, from uh, being now famous from from dad's uh, position. Well, we can we can see on this next slide uh, Pop Wooler, as you uh, called him, Wolf's father and uh, his three brothers. And that photo actually uh, taken at Rydal School where Wolf learned his uh, his sport developed, I should say, his uh, sporting skills. It may come as a surprise to everyone on the call uh, this evening that actually Wilf's first love was football. That was because uh, he actually uh, went to school initially in Clandidno at what is now John Bright Grammar School. But uh, through the influence of his mother, who was uh, a head teacher of a school in Roson Sea, Wilf went to Rydal School, and of course, the rest is history. From Rydal, Wilf went on to Cambridge University. Here oh. is uh, a photo of Wilf in his first year uh, as a student at uh, Christ College in uh, Cambridge. I don't know if any members of the uh, of the Wooler family have got any of the, the stories of Wilf's undergraduate days. I think he had quite, he had quite a lively a lively time. I think um, he was a double blue, of course. Cricket. Yes. Uh, it took him a few years to get to Cambridge because he kept failing his Latin. He had to have Latin to get into Cambridge in those days. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, he he came out with a degree in anthropology. I think. Yes. Um, yes. He had uh, a lot of sporting friends, and there's one story which uh, I think I'll share um, with everyone this evening, that Wilf would often have many of his sporting friends uh, around to his flat in the college. And uh, one evening, there were so many of his uh, rugby and cricket playing friends upstairs. Unfortunately, the ceiling of the uh, flat uh, collapsed and uh, one of the uh, very erudite tutors of the college was uh, sat below trying to write a paper on some aspect of uh, physics, I think it was, and uh, Wilf ended up astride one of the beams uh, as the ceiling, as I said, disintegrated. And uh, Wilf, of course, duly apologised, as of course you would only expect, and uh, the damage was uh, swiftly repaired. But a measure of... Uh, of Wilf's popularity as a young man and as a sportsman. Well, Wilf then came uh, down from Cambridge, as, uh, as Jackie said, as a uh, double blue. Wilf had already represented Wales in 1932-33 in the first ever Welsh rugby team that beat England at Twickenham. He was in the 1935-35 Wales team that beat the All Blacks at Cardiff Arms Park. And of course, when he came down and moved into the coal trade in Cardiff, he was signed up very quickly by Cardiff Rugby Club. And he was often referred to 
as the Prince of Wales. Well, with his sporting friends in 1939, when the war clouds gathered, Wilf then joined the anti-aircraft brigade. Quite a few of his friends, including Les Spence, they all joined the 88th Battalion. And after a, a phase of training in South Wales and also in other parts of the UK, they headed off to the Far East. What happened next in 1942, I'm sure many of you are aware, was that Wilf, along with others, were taken prisoner of the Japanese. And for the next three long years, Wilf was a POW in Changi and in other camps. In fact, when he came back, as you can see from this next image in 1945, no longer was he the big burly sporting colossus. He'd lost, like so many other people in the POW camps, a lot of weight. I think Brian, uh, Brian Woollett, you've got uh, some reminiscences to share with us this evening of uh, Wilf's time as a yeah, POW. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, he, he never shared with us the horror stories of being a POW. He told us lots of stories. Um, and, and in fact, he was, uh, we did find out after they'd actually, they landed in Singapore and he was, he, they, were captured, they were captured almost immediately. So he was, he spent three long, long years. Uh, uh, I know it affected him deeply, but on the positive side, it, it, it taught him, I think it taught him his fearless, he, could, he, he didn't have to fear anything. He could survive that, he could survive anything. Um, it also gave him a prodigious appetite. Uh, he would actually eat anything and never waste anything on the plate. Uh, they used to cook all sorts of things there. In fact, he trained, he and uh, I think Spence was in the same camp, Uncle Les as we knew, they trained a monkey to go and steal food from the guards um, and basically survived that way. Uh, they also trained a, a dog um, who, the, uh, who the guards had mistreated and uh, he had two broken legs. They nursed him back to life and he was a, a pet. Dad always loved dogs after that. Um, and in fact, one thing my sister was telling me is they used to try and cook anything. They didn't know what it was half the time. And at one stage, Dad picked up this thing and it turned out it was a loofah. It was completely inedible. But they did what they could to survive and uh, it was a, it was a, a difficult time. Um, but he came back and he's a survivor. Yeah, and um, the photograph here showing Wilf about to kick off in a uh, special game, a special fundraising game that was taking place at the Arms Park to raise money for various military charities. Wilf was one of the lucky few to survive the long, hard years in the Far East. And the only upshot as far as his sporting career was concerned was that his quite fragile physical state meant that he could no longer play rugby and cricket became his sporting love. Just before we move on to Glamorgan in the 1946 season, it would be very remiss if we didn't also talk about the wartime experiences of some of the other members of the 1948 championship winning team. <clears throat> this next photograph shows Jim Pleece, the batsman and outstanding fielder, who was a member of, as I said, the championship uh, winning team. He, in the war though, had been a very young wireless operator working with the Royal Engineers. And here's a photo of Jim in 1944, when he was still only 21, and just a few weeks before June the 5th, 1944. Of course, uh, the day, D-Day, Operation Overlord, and actually Jim was in charge of some of the landing craft that headed across the English Channel on that fateful morning and he actually landed on the beaches in Normandy and helped to create uh, wireless 
bases for the arriving troops, as well as heading back then to other ships that were bringing in more and more soldiers to do service fighting for king and country. Back in the photo here for 1946, let's not forget that uh, Johnny Clay, the captain there of the Glamorgan team, he also did wartime service and Colonel Clay made sure that uh, Captain Emerus Davis, there on the right hand side who was serving in the army, that Emerus's leave always coincided with when Glamorgan were playing. Uh, a wonderful effort by, uh, by Colonel Clay. And also, we mustn't forget as well, and I'm going to ask uh, Tony Davis, the son of uh, this wonderful man, we mustn't forget what Hayden Davis also did during the war. Tony, what was, uh, what was your father's role? Well, he, he, was, um, he was commissioned as a captain in the army. As you can see, he looks very smart there with that moustache and everything. Um, he served most of, most of the war in Landrignod Wells, where he was actually in charge of training uh, transport, um, training soldiers to drive vehicles, um, motorbikes, motor vehicles, because in those days be before the war, of course, not many people learned to drive. So, it was his responsibility to mobilise mobilize the troops so they could drive in Europe. Wonderful. And so with the, the combined efforts then of the, uh, of the Glamorgan cricketers, the, uh, the efforts then assisting military operations, and in 1946, Glamorgan were able to restart their championship campaign. This is an extract from uh, the scorecard of uh, that season and you can see Glamorgan's first game, there were no easy games but in fact very similar to uh, this coming summer of 2021 when Glamorgan will be heading up to Yorkshire to start their championship campaign but back in 1946 Yorkshire were the first team to play at Cardiff Arms Park. There were, I gather, a few concerns about the state of the pitch at the Arms Park, because just like St Helens, Swansea, it had been used by the military for wartime manoeuvres. The first game ended in a draw, but then Glamorgan in their first away game, going up to Old Trafford in Lancashire, and that's where they opened their campaign with a victory. And I can remember a story, the late and the great Phil Clift, another member of the 1948 championship winning squad. I can still remember a story Phil Clift told me about there was there was Glamorgan arriving at Old Trafford with just 12 players and their scorer. They'd only had three nets at the arms park. <coughs> they arrived at Old Trafford where they saw to maybe a combination of shock and horror, a series of 12 nets, a phalanx of net bowlers, and some superb facilities. But it was those players wearing the daffodil sweater who won. And uh, Glamorgan actually had quite a decent season in 1946. They certainly were able to regroup and restart. And during that summer, Johnny Clay was helping to groom Wilf Wooler as captain. Well, I'll say more about Wilf in a minute. It would be very remiss, though, not just to mention someone who featured and still is in the record books for the game on June the 8th. You can see, ladies and gentlemen, Saturday, June the 8th, when India visited Cardiff Arms Park. I'm talking about this man, Peter Judge, maybe not a household name, maybe someone who you've never heard of as a Glamorgan cricketer. Well, Peter Judge had played before the war in Middlesex. He'd also done national service in India, 
played a little bit of first class cricket in India. He joined Glamorgan before the war and was available again in 1946. And in that game against India at Cardiff Arms Park, it was on the final day when he entered the game's record books. Sadly, there'd been a lot of rain in the game. The game was meandering towards a draw and Peter Judge was out, the last man out in Glamorgan's first innings. The non-striking batsman was Johnny Clay and he said, look, let's stay out here. Let's not bother with uh, the interval between innings. Uh, we'll bat again, no problems. And Peter Judge then was dismissed second ball of the second innings. And in fact, he goes down in history as a batsman who was dismissed twice within the space of a minute. I don't think despite the efforts of the England batsmen uh, today in India, I don't think any of those batsmen uh, would uh, enter the record books. And Peter Judge probably has a place in history that no one else will ever take away from him. Well, as I said, during the 1946 season, Johnny Clay was able to uh, pass on many, many years of experience and knowledge to Wilf Wooler. And in 1947, the Glamorgan Committee unanimously appointed Wilf as their new captain. Here you can see Wilf being warmly con congratulated <coughs> on, his, uh, on his new post. Again, I think it's interesting just to notice how gaunt and, again, how thin Wilf still was in 1947 and still maybe recovering from the horrors of his time in the Far East. But Wilf certainly had a very astute brain. I know he'd been the chess champion in Changi. He also was a bridge player of some repute. And he realized that Glamorgan needed to strengthen their squad. <clears throat> and several players were acquired. The gentleman on the left of this next photograph, this photograph, as you can see, taken at Swansea in 1947. The gentleman on the left there, Len Munzer, a man we'll hear an awful lot more about in the course of the next hour. Len had started his career initially as a leg spinner with Middlesex, but he'd arrived with Glamorgan knowing that he could also bowl off spin as well. And under the tutelage of both Johnny Clay and George Lavis, as well as uh, the advice from the gentleman there on the right, Emrys Davis, Len decided to focus on off spin. And we'll hear an awful lot more about his wonderful efforts in a few minutes time. I should also draw attention to two other people who were acquired by Glamorgan ahead of the 1948 season. The two gentlemen on the right, well, the man on the extreme right, Norman Heaver, and next to him, Jimmy Eagleston. Both of them had played for Middlesex. Norman Heaver had quite a reputation as a useful, quite skiddy, seam and swing bowler. And Jimmy Eagleston was an outstanding fielder and a useful batsman. Just like Len Munzer, they were desperate to play first 11 cricket. And it was through Wilf that the offer came to come to Wales and to join Glamorgan. But there was something else that Wilf took great pride in. And we're just going to leap forward in the timeline to this wonderful photo from 1951. I'll be saying a little bit more about the 1951 match. This is the game at St Helens when Glamorgan defeated South Africa. But it's a photo that will help to explain the emphasis 
on fielding. And I know uh, Tony Davis is uh, going to uh, tell us now because, of course, his father, not featuring in this photograph, but his father would have been uh, behind the stumps. We can see there at leg slip Alan Watkins. We can see at uh, backward short leg Phil Clift. We can see as well, uh, we can see Jim Police, and of course, Wilf at, uh, standing there about to catch the ball. Tony, share with us then your thoughts and your memories from your father about the emphasis that Wilf gave to fielding. Thank you, Andrew. Well, in, in 47, uh, it was a particularly um, hot summer and it, it was dominated by by batsmen. I mean, if you remember, or if you recall it, the two guys from Middlesex called Compton and Edridge dominated the, the season. And Glamorgan, or the skipper, if I may call Wilfred the skipper from, from now on, because that's what he was known as. Um, he got together with the, some of the older pros and, and they, they thought we've got to do something for next year to combat uh, the strength of batting. And they, decided that they were going to play bowl at the leg stump. I'm not saying this was the um, the body line tour or anything like that, but they decided to, with the spinners they had and the medium paces to bowl at the leg stump and pack the leg side close to the wicket with fielders, which resulted in some amazing catching um, from, from Watkins, Munster. They, they all got together. Um, to develop this huge fielding skill, which in the it worked to the end of, end of the 1947 season, and of course in the 1948 season it became it became their landmark. That's that, that's where they were really strong and had the had the system in place to win games. <clears throat> Fielding vital, vital for their um, for the future. Thank you, Tony, for those uh, wonderful <laughs> words. And of course, uh, the slow wickets at uh, Swansea. We'll talk a little bit more about the wickets later on. The slow wickets at uh, Swansea and at Cardiff certainly helping the Glamorgan spinners. We'll move on to uh, some of the decisive moments from the 1948 season and in particular we'll talk about the game against Essex at Brentwood when uh, these two gentlemen on the screen Willie Jones and Di Davis shared a partnership of 313 for the third wicket against Essex as I said a club record, and I gathered Tony Davis that uh, they both used the Welsh language. They did. They spoke in Welsh to each other, which I'm sure Alan and Ivian spoke in Welsh to each other when they were playing. Um, Quite true. Glamorgan, Glamorgan, Glamorgan had a bit of a reputation when they were fielding as well because they used to they used to talk to each other in Welsh, and um, some of the opposing batsmen. Um, we're not quite sure what was going on. And whilst it wasn't um, Welsh sledging, um, it, did, it did unnerve some of the batsmen and um, it did result now and again in a wicket. Um, I gather that um, Hayden, sometimes when uh, Glamorgan were uh, fielding, um, Hayden would join in with the uh, Welsh language conversations as well. <coughs> oh yeah, yeah. Definitely. And what, a, and what about Wilf? Did, uh, did Wilf uh, join in? Wilf was not a Welsh speaker, so he was, a, he was left out of the quartet rather. Okay. But he, didn't, he, he, still, he still had a few words to say anyway, so it, it, um, it, it made up some of the Welsh speaking as well. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, let's just move on to the... Uh, the month of August 1948, because it was during that month that Alan Watkins was called up from the Glamorgan team to join the England squad. 
And as a result, Glamorgan, with a very small squad, as I mentioned earlier, with players who were, were uh, returning from national service, it meant that Glamorgan's resources were severely depleted. Of course, Wilf, though, had a trump card up his sleeve. Here is uh, Johnny Clay, the uh, great off spinner who returned to the Glamorgan side and helped Glamorgan to achieve one of their finest victories, as we can see here, against Surrey at Cardiff Arms Park. The Surrey batsman walking up on the foreground with Will Fuller leading his team and Johnny Clay behind. We can see in this photo as well the, uh, the wonderful flats at Westgate Street. And uh, I know that uh, Wilf, as a, as a single man, was actually, uh, an inha was actually living in one of the flats. I, I know some of the members of the, uh, the Wooler family are quite keen to, uh, to actually share some stories about the, uh, the Westgate Street flats. Well, I, it's, it's, hi, it's me. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I've got any stories because uh, that's where I, was, I lived when I was born. Uh, Dad was playing North Ant. The Morgan were playing North Ant on, on that ground um, while I was being born. He obviously was playing cricket rather than being at the birth, which is what he did for the arrival of all of us. Um, but we lived in those flats, I think, probably for a couple of years. And uh, the uh, six-month-old six baby who lived in the flat upstairs is still a close friend, 70 years on. And later, Nick, my brother Nick, uh, also lived in one of those flats. They, they were great, great flats. And of course, mum could sit on the balcony holding me and watching dad play later, um, which, was, which was nice. Wonderful. And uh, of course, as we can see in this, in this photograph, we can, we can see that quite a few of the residents of the flats would uh, actually have parties and would invite friends in and would watch uh, and enjoy Glamorgan uh, as they moved on and secured further victory. Andrew, sorry, Andrew, what you can also see in that photo is crowds of little boys. My, my memory of whenever I did go down to the cricket was there were always a crowd of little boys following Dad about saying, Mr. Mr. Wooler, Mr. Wooler, can we have your autograph? And it just, it was like Pied Piper. <laughs> yeah. And um, we can, as I said earlier, several of them, uh, of course, this photograph taken in August and several of the other people in the photo who were the office workers in, uh, in the centre of Cardiff who were taking a, an extra long lunch break. Well, on now to... Andrew, Hello. May, I just, may I just make a point? No, no Woolless child was allowed to make, have any wedding or anything of consequence unless we check the fixtures first. <laughs> Well, of course, that's perfect. I, that's perfectly understandable, John. Well, we're going to move on now to Bournemouth, and here's Dean Park, Bournemouth in 1948, and the venue for one of the most historic and most famous of all Morgan matches in the club's 100 years as a first-class county. Glamorgan arrived at Dean Park, knowing that all they needed to do was to secure one more victory for the county title. They had two games to play. There was Leicestershire at the end of the season, but Wilf was determined that let's, let's wrap it up. We're on to something of a role. And as luck would have it, Glamorgan won the toss. Arnold Dyson and Emrys Davis walked out to the middle to open the batting but remarkably they were both back in the pavilion at Dean Park within 15 minutes in fact so were the rest of the players because rain fell many many Glamorgan supporters had ventured down to the south coast many people possibly had changed their holiday plans and had decided to have a holiday in Bournemouth rather than somewhere else. I'm quite sure that on Saturday night, there was plenty of talk about whether the weather would stop Glamorgan. 
and I'm quite sure on the Sunday morning as well, that the pews in the churches and the chapels on the south coast, as well as back home in South Wales, were full of Glamorgan supporters praying for a sunny day. Well, as we all know, God is a Welshman, and Monday dawned bright and clear. Glamorgan got the runs that they needed, and then Hampshire went into bat, Glamorgan knowing that they needed a further 20 wickets. Here you can see Wilf Wooler leading out the team into the field. You can see Johnny Clay poised there, ready to weave his magic spell around the Hampshire batsman. It happened. Hampshire crumbled. Hampshire had to follow on. And Wilf led his team out again the following day, knowing now that the equation was just 10 wickets. Well, as luck would have it, although uh, I'm not sure whether I should really say luck, but one of the umpires standing in the game was this man in the white coat. Di Davis, the Glamorgan stalwart from before the Second World War. By now, Di was a first-class umpire, and you can see him here standing, wearing a, his usual tie, which of course had the Welsh dragon on it, and under his coat was his old Glamorgan sweater. Well, he must have had a smile on his face as his former colleagues took wickets and took catches. And as Hampshire's last pair were at the wicket, Johnny Clay was bowling at Dye's end. And with one of the balls, he hit Charlie Knott, the Hampshire number 11 on the pads. Johnny Clay turned round to Dye Davis. And before he could complete the Auzat in Auzat, Dye Davis had his finger up and said, the immortal words, that's out, and we've won the championship. Tony, your father was right there behind the stumps. I'm sure he would have agreed that uh, Di's decision was absolutely spot on. Um, it was definitely Plem, Andrew, no yeah. question. It, it would have knocked out all three, I gather. All three, no question about it. But the, the, the fitting thing that happened on that particular, um, it was Johnny Clay that took that wicket, took the 10th took the wicket and won the championship. And it's so fitting that I'm sure Maurice Turnbull was looking down upon the game um, because both Maurice and, and John Clay did so much to keep the Morgan live through the 30s and it was a, it really was a fitting climax to, well, what was an, an incredible uh, championship win, um, which first, first time later to be followed by the other boys, but first time is always the most important. Indeed, and um, here we can see the Glamorgan team on the balcony after that uh, wonderful moment. I gather that Wilf before going up onto the balcony, gathered the team together in the Dean Park Pavilion, had a few words uh, with the team to pass on his own personal thanks, and then the team gathered on the balcony. Of course, Wilf, not only was he uh, a leading player with Glamorgan that year, he was also being highly regarded by the MCC. There are stories that, in fact, uh, his availability to play and to tour with the MCC during the winter. He had been sounded out, but uh, his work and his work as an insurance broker in Cardiff, uh, that prevented him from, ac from accepting those offers. But when he had been chosen to play for the gentlemen of England against Australia at Lords. So it wasn't Wilf who actually led the Glamorgan team back to Cardiff that night, it was actually uh, Johnny Clay, together with the gentleman on the left, George Lavis, 
who by now was the assistant coach as well, and a fine baritone singer. The team headed back to Bournemouth Railway Station, boarded the plane, they all piled into one of the compartments where they started to celebrate. And about 10 o'clock that night at Cardiff General Railway Station, the Glamorgan team returned to Welsh soil. You can see Johnny Clay his way with the team through the lobby at the station, surrounded by so many joyous Glamorgan supporters. The gentleman there on the right-hand side with his hand up and lowering it down, the legendary broadcaster, Alan Williams. And uh, the thing why Alan was there was that the BBC were doing a live interview with Johnny and the team on their return to Cardiff. Well, from there, it was off to Cardiff Athletic Club. And it was there, in the words of the wonderful Welsh song, it literally was all through the night. The party, the celebration went on. The players' wives and families met them the following morning. I gather that Mary Clay, the wife of Johnny Clay, said to Wilf, my word, I've never seen Johnny in such a state before. Thank goodness Glamorgan have only won the championship on this occasion. But there was great celebration within the organ ranks. And as you can see from the newspapers the following day, plenty of coverage, even though it was still the war years and austerity and a shortage of news, but plenty of coverage for the Morgan's title winning success at Bournemouth. Quite interesting there on the right hand side as well as an article as well which shows that there were plans, in fact, afoot to invite Don Bradman to play at Cardiff in one of the special celebratory games held at the end of the 1948 season. Glamorgan organised a game at Cardiff, they organised a game at Swansea, and an invitation went out to Don Bradman to come and join Glamorgan in their celebratory game and to play against Glamorgan for the opposition. Don said no, he headed up to Scotland instead and went on to score his final 100 on UK soil at Aberdeen. History could have been very different because had he accepted the offer from the Glamorgan committee, Don Bradman's final 100 on Welsh on uh, British soil could have occurred in Wales. There were floods of telegrams coming in as well, and here you can see Johnny Clay opening them. Don't forget, of course, ladies and gentlemen, that Wilf Wooler was still playing for the gentlemen of England up at Lords against the Australians. But shortly after this, I gather Tony, Tony Davis, that the uh, Glamorgan team headed off to Pembrokeshire for a celebratory party. Yes, indeed. They, um, they were invited to stay at Amrith Castle um, by a gentleman by the name of Roscoe Howells, who was a, a, a big supporter of Glamorgan, but he was also the, the man of Pembrokeshire, as he'd like to be, like to be known. He was a very famous author, um, but he, um, he entertained the boys um, on a three-day jolly um, which um, led to other jollies later on um, again in the 50s. They, end of season, they all used to always go to Amherst Castle for an end of season party. And I gathered Di Davis, who'd been umpire at Bournemouth also, uh, joined his former colleagues down west and they all had a, a splendid time. In fact, there were as well some wonderful uh, events as well that just kept on rolling during October. Here you can see the special presentation 
and special function that the mayor and lady mayoress of Cardiff put on for the Morgan team. Here you can see them uh, gathered on the steps inside City Hall, a special function being held there to the delight of Will and his team. This is a very nice uh, photograph, uh, sorry, very nice cartoon, I should say, that uh, Brian Wooler has very kindly uh, shared with us for the city. And uh, again, a cartoon from the Western Mail with that figure who we encountered in the first of our talks, Dame Wales over there on the left-hand side. Dame Wales in our previous cartoons had been worried about Glamorgan surviving. We can see now Dame Wales over the moon, very happy that uh, Glamorgan have won. And you can see the daffodils blooming with uh, Wilf's face there and uh, a little bit of J.C. Clay's fertilizer. And as the cartoonist has said, a little bit of spade work as well. Well, it would be very remiss of me if we didn't also mention 1948 being the year when Wilf tied the knot with Enid. And I know Penny Wooler, Wilf's daughter, is going to share with us a few words about how Wilf and Enid met. Yes, um, this is probably, as, as children, one of our favourite stories. Uh, and we used to ask Dad to repeat it again and again. It happened in early 48. He was in the Glamorgan offices, um, which was second floor, looking down um, onto St Mary Street. And Rosemary Driscoll, the secretary then, pointed out a very attractive girl standing at the, the bus stop. And dad went rushing down uh, to go and meet this girl who of course had gone at that point. He then spent many weeks, um, I suppose you would call him a stalker nowadays, but he spent many weeks um, hunting her down. And as chance would have it, in the February, he was covering a, a, a rugby match. And there he saw his lovely young woman with a friend. Uh, so immediately went over and started talking and found out, asked what were they doing that evening, Saturday evening, and they said they were going to the university dance. So dad absolutely blagged his way in, of course, because he wasn't a steward, saying, professing who he was, got, it, got himself into the dance, went up to mum and said, uh, do you like children? She said, yes. He said, I'm going to marry you and we're going to have four or five children. And that was it. They were married then in the September. Wonderful. So... It, it, it's very romantic. And of course, Wilf was entirely right. Four or five, sorry, five children being uh, what he promised. And of course, uh, all five I'm delighted uh, with us here this evening. Well, 1948 was a wonderful year also for one other Glamorgan player, Alan Watkins, we can see here on the left of the next photo strapping his pads on in the nets at Cardiff Arms Park. And it was Alan who had spent actually the months of August with the England team. He'd been injured, he'd received treatment and uh, had to rely on looking at newspapers, the stock press, the latest news section, to find out how his colleagues were uh, getting on in their progress towards winning the county title. But at the end of the 1948 season, it was confirmed that Alan, even though, as I said, he picked up a shoulder injury, it had been confirmed that Alan had secured a place on the MCC Winter Tour to South Africa. And 
in February 1949, Alan became Glamorgan's first batsman to score 100 in Test cricket. Alan achieving the feat at Ellis Park in Johannesburg. It meant so much to him. And in fact, in later years, when he was coaching at Framlingham College in Suffolk and later at Oundle School in Northamptonshire, that uh, Alan, together with his wife, Molly, called their house Ellis Park. Well, Alan wasn't the only Glamorgan player close to an England caller because Hayden Davis was also very much in the minds of the England selectors. And Tony, your, your father had been chosen in 1946 to play in the test trial. Yes, indeed. Um, he, he played in the 1946 um, test trial um, and his, um, the opposition was a guy called Godfrey Evans. Um, and eventually Godfrey get, was selected to play for England on the, on the basis of his superior batting skills. Um, although he was, my father was told that he was considered to be, he was considered to be a wicket keeper uh, of, of repute and, and easily, could play uh, the same role as Godfrey Evans. Um, my father said to me uh, m many years later, and, and I use this word, I put some in inverted commas, um, he did say that Godfrey was far more flamboyant in his style and laughed. But so he took it, he, he took, he took it in good humour. Indeed, and carried on removing the bales for Glamorgan. For Hamilton. some time afterwards, yes. Indeed, indeed. But one man who did make it into the England team uh, in 1950 was the next Glamorgan great we're just going to be talking about for the next few minutes. It's Gilbert Parkhouse. Here we can see on the right-hand side wearing his Glamorgan blazer. We can see Emrys Davis congratulating him. And on the left-hand side there, that's Billy Bancroft, the former Glamorgan cricketer from the minor county days, the former Welsh rugby international, whose family lived at St Helens. And it was Billy who had coached Gilbert as a very young man on the outfield at St Helens and had seen Gilbert head off to Wycliffe College in Stonehouse in Gloucestershire had seen Gilbert make his Glamorgan debut in a wartime friendly in 1944, then score over a thousand runs for Glamorgan in 1948, and with sheer weight of runs into the England team in 1950. Well, I'm going to bring in at this stage now Stephen Hedges, the, uh, the son of Bernard Hedges, who for many, many years opened the batting with Gilbert. And Gilbert, as we can see here in this next photo, wearing his England cap, playing at Lords against the West Indians. And it was Gilbert's promotion into the England team, I gather, Steve, that gave your father his first opportunity. Yes, I, I realised tonight listening that uh, I was born in the year that Gilbert's uh, career ended with Glamorgan in 1964. Um, so unfortunately, I, I never ever got to see him bat and I, I've never seen any moving images of him batting either. Um, so we're just left with statistics and stories. You mentioned that he got a thousand runs in the 1948 season. He repeated that 14 more times before he retired. Uh, Tom Cartwright, the, the uh, Warwickshire and England bowler, who of course uh, married a Welsh girl, um, he, he talked about um, Gilbert in his book and, and compared him to some other players who had a great touch and great balance. Um, so he mentioned Arthur Milton, Arthur Clothback Milton, because he didn't make a sound when he hit the ball. George Emmett of Gloucestershire, Joe Hardstaff of Nottinghamshire, Dennis Brooks of North Hants, all these players with a great gentleness and a great purity that kind of set them apart from any other batsman. 
um, there's a famous cricket writer, R.C. Robertson Glasgow, talked about Don Bradman uh, and his batting as combining poetry with murder. And I sometimes imagine what it must have been like watching Gilbert batting, very beautiful, but very ruthless at the same time. Um, my dad's debut was against Somerset um, on the 3rd of June, 1950, uh, at the Arms Park. Uh, and in that game, uh, Gilbert scored 121 in the first innings and 148 in the second. So he equaled the record of uh, a batsman scoring a century in each innings of a county match. And in the previous game against Warwickshire, he'd scored another 100. Um, so it's perhaps no surprise that he was called up to that uh, Lord's Test match. He batted uh, at five, believe it or not, in that game behind Len Hutton, Cyril Washbrook, Washbrook um, Brian Edrich, and uh, Hubert Doggott. Um, the West Indies had a lead of 176 on the first innings, and in the second innings, they scored 425. Um, whilst Dad was making his maiden first class 100 at Sussex, Gilbert was uh, uh, making a battling 48 with Cyril Washbrook, trying to uh, save a game. Um, it was the game that's been made very famous by a lovely Calypso record. Those little pals of mine, Ramadin Valentine, the West Indian spinner, took 18 wickets in the match, and the West Indies won by 326 runs. And Glamorgan actually had a hand in that victory because here's a very famous photograph of Alf Valentine as a youngster, and the Glamorgan link is the gentleman on the right-hand side because that's Jack Mercer, the former Glamorgan bowler, the man who in 1936 had taken all 10 wickets for 51 runs against Worcestershire at New Road. By now, Jack was uh, plying his trade as a coach with Northamptonshire and during the winter months, spending time in the Caribbean. And it was his advice which helped to turn Al Valentine there into a fantastic left arm spinner. Well, Stephen, there's your, uh, there is uh, your, your father then uh, in 1950 during his first year on the Glamorgan staff. Perhaps you could just share with us how, how Bernard had come to Glamorgan's attention and his background growing up, because I know he was very much a prominent all-round sportsman in Pontypridd. I think the first thing I probably have to say looking at that photo is um, when I wrote my book about Dad uh, a few years ago, I was very lucky to speak to Robin Marler, who was the Sussex captain and cricket writer. And the first thing he said to me was, ah, oh, yes, Bernard, lovely man, terrible teeth. Um, and I think uh, <laughs> he's showing all the signs of being a, a rugby fullback uh, there in, in the days when uh, fullbacks used to take the full brunt of uh, the forwards coming at them. Um, yeah, Dad was born in 1927, a big family. He was the eldest of eight. Um, his dad was a miner, but invalided out of the mines in the early 1930s. He has a memory of being operated on at the kitchen table when he was about seven or eight years old. So um, actually reaching uh, the status of a first class cricketer was something quite special for him, his family and the town he came from. Uh, two things perhaps made get, or gave him the real opportunities and developed his, his sporting ability. He spent his war years um, at the county school for boys in Pontypridd. And I think like many, many grammar school boys um, honed his skills and honed his technique uh, playing for them. And then after the war, um, uh, he, he did his national service. Uh, and in there, again, he got opportunities to play top class opposition and to come to the attention of, um, of, of Glamorgan. Um, he, he played against Peter May uh, at Lords when the RAF played the army. And then in a match up in Jesmond in Newcastle, he got 148. Um, and he was bowled that day by a chap called Malcolm Hilton, who went on to play for Lancashire. But Malcolm had just burst onto the scene about a month before they played that game as the boy who bowled Bradman. He got Bradman out twice on uh, the Australians' last tour of, of, uh, of Britain. Um, so, yeah, I think one person who was very important to Dad in that transition from playing at school and 
uh, and towards becoming a Glamorgan player was George Lavis. Um, Dad never had many um, uh, artifacts or evidence of him playing uh, the first class game. They're not, not no trophies or mementos or anything like that. The only thing we found um, after he died in a cupboard was a pewter mug which the, with the word George Lavis written on it. And it was George's uh, a mug that was produced for his testimonial year, which I think was 1950 as well. Um, and uh, at one point, my mom suggested that they could put pens and pencils in this mug. And my dad said, if you do that, it's going to be divorce. Um, so that tells you how much uh, George meant, I think, uh, to him. And also Don Shepherd thought very highly of George as well. Um, when dad made his maiden first class hundred, uh, the Western Mail did a little piece on him. He was unknown to uh, perhaps sports lovers in South Wales. And they described him as the tallest of the shortest. They said he was uh, five foot five and a half. Jim Police was five foot five. And Willie Jones was five foot four and a half. So I don't know how true that was, but mum and dad used to bicker and argue long, long time later about how tall he was. Dad used to say he was five foot eight. Mum insisted he was always smaller than that. So. Well, we can see George Lavis here in this next photograph uh, passing on a few tips to another uh, aspiring Glamorgan player. It's, it's, it's George Bernard Shaw and um, Penny, Penny Wooler. I know that uh, you and the rest of the Wooler clan would visit later in, in, in later years the restaurant that yes. George Shaw ran in Cardiff. Yes, George, um, George Bernard Shaw was a, a regular at, at our house and I think Dad supported him very much. And he actually um, opened a restaurant in Wellfield Street, uh, Wellfield Road in Cardiff and called it the Pygmalion, which of course was very clever because of his name. Indeed, and I know that uh, George fought an awful lot <clears throat> excuse me, thought an awful lot of uh, George's bowling and here we can see him passing on a few tips but George very much did the same to several of the other young aspiring players who we're now going to be talking about. I think it was a mark of uh, the man that he didn't have his favourites, yes he was very close and thought a lot of Bernard Hedges, but George was quite prepared to give up his time and to help any aspiring young Glamorgan player. So we move on to the year 1951, where another one of George Lavis's protégés had an absolute field day. I'm talking about now the man at number nine in the batting order, at that game at St Helens in Swansea in 1951, when Glamorgan dramatically defeated the South Africans. You can see there the man I'm talking about, uh, Jim McConnon. Jim was uh, a man who'd moved to South Wales actually because of football. He'd previously been a footballer with West Ham and also with Aston Villa. Whilst with West Ham, he'd been on the staff of Essex, and he moved to Newport to play professionally for Lovells, the well-known sweet manufacturers, and he also turned out for Newport Cricket Club. He bowled at the time a little bit of medium pace, he dabbled in a little bit of off-spin. But what in particular impressed George Lavis and the other Glamorgan coaches was the fact that Jim McConnon had very, very long fingers and imparted much spin on the ball. He, in this wonderful game in 1951 against the South Africans at Swansea, he achieved the feat of a hat trick and literally turned the game on its head. Glamorgan, as you can see in their first innings, had made 111, and then Len Munzer, together with Wilf, had bowled out the South Africans for exactly 111 as well. 
When Glamorgan batted for a second time, Jim Police and Wilf Wooler shared an important partnership. But the South Africans were left with a target of 147 to win. And at T on the final on, on the second day, at T they were 54 without loss and seemingly were cruising towards another victory. But in the space of the next 45 minutes after the tea interval, Glamorgan took all 10 wickets as the South Africans dramatically collapsed for a further 25 runs. As I said, Jim McConnell claimed six, Len Munzer claimed four, and as we can see from this next photo, the crowd ran on to the outfield at St. Helens to congratulate the Glamorgan team who had literally turned the game on its head in that period of play after the tea interval. Tony, your uh, father was keeping wicket again that day and I gather he, or I gather you I should say, you have some memories of what your father told you about Wilf's speech to the team during the tea interval. My father described it uh, the, the, as, as, as like being in a rugby dressing room with the captain screaming and yelling at everybody, convincing them that, that they were going to win the game. And the players stood with their mouths open, apparently, believing what Wolf was telling them. They walked out of the dressing room, down the, down the famous steps at Swansea. And would you believe it? What he said was true, and they won the game. He was he was inspired beyond all belief. He was convinced that the Morgan were going to win the game even at that point. And that photo we saw earlier on of Wilf uh, taking the catch off Clive Van Rijneveld, the ball I gather bounced off his burly frame. Wilf never flinched, of course, and uh, caught the rebound. A wonderful. Wonderful moment, and uh, I'd like to bring in now Mark Shepherd, the uh, the son of Don. Of course, Don in these days was a fast bowler, and uh, I gather, Mark, that uh, your father also had very, very clear memories of this wonderful day in Glamorgan history. Yes, indeed. Um, Dad speaks so fondly of winning that game. He was just starting in the Morgan team. Um, but he says, and the funny thing is, um, he presented me with a, as a youngster with a box and he said, look, this will protect you. And, and it was a metal box with a leather outside, which protects all the important bits of a young Welshman. He said, this is from the 1951 South Africans. They left it in the dressing room, uh, which was extraordinary. I've still got it to this day upstairs. And he, he just was overawed by the whole day, really, by winning, you know, by the great Will Fuller captain inside and 25,000 people being there on one of the days. And it was a magnificent day, a magnificent day for Welsh cricket, really. And an evening full of Welsh song, full of Welsh hoyle, full of Welsh spirit. I gather as well that during that remarkable passage of play after tea, that some of the South African players had actually got changed back into their civvies, thinking that victory was inevitable. And... I gather from Jim Pleece, another member of the uh, team in 51, Jim was fielding out on the boundary and in fact uh, saw some of the South African players coming into bat without wearing socks, with their shirts hanging out and literally still doing up their flannels as they quickly hurried out to the middle. Well, Wilf's team in 51, the only county team that year to defeat the Springboks. Of course, it meant that Jim McConnell 
after his feat of taking a hat trick, as I said, six for 10 in the space of 22 balls. Jim McConnon was on the England selectors radar. And in 1954, Jim played in two tests and also went on the 54 55 MCC tour to Australia and New Zealand. Well, also in the thoughts of the England selectors in the 1950s was Alan Watkins. Alan continued to play with great distinction for both Glamorgan and for England. And in the summer of 1954, Alan achieved the coveted double, 1,640 runs, as well as 103 wickets. But in 1954 as well, Wilf did the double. Wilf making 1,059 runs and also taking 107 wickets. We've spent a lot of time this evening talking about Wilf's captaincy and Wilf's fielding. But we mustn't forget what a fine batsman he was. We mustn't forget either what an outstanding bowler he was. Quite prepared to open the bowling quite prepared to open the batting. He was quite prepared to do whatever it was that Glamorgan required. A man who very much led by example, and as Tony said uh, a few minutes ago, very much the skipper. So Stephen, Stephen Hedges, here is uh, your, or here is your father standing alongside uh, the skipper looking very much um, uh, very dapper there with his uh, Glamorgan blazer on and a neckerchief and Bernard there proudly wearing his uncapped Glamorgan sweater because of course the daffodil is still in bud. Your father I know Steve uh, thought an awful lot of work. Yeah I, I love this photograph because it sums up the uh a period in, in uh, English cricket when you had uh, the amateurs and the professionals and um, Wilf was one of the leading amateurs in the country and you, you can see in the way he's looking at the camera and the way he's dressed there's a uh, he's very relaxed and comfortable if you like with the attention that he's getting dad young working class boy from the valleys you know keen to get on but still a little bit kind of frightened of the whole experience I think um, and it, at that time, I think amateurs were the ones that, I mean, they still dressed in different changing rooms to the, to the rest of the players. They often ate separately to them. So it was a very different kind of experience for, for both of them. Uh, and sometimes, I, certainly my dad, I think he perhaps best described as, as the amateur professional because he, he believed in all the Corinthian values that I think uh, went along with the, the amateur game. Um, Wilf, perhaps contrastingly, although being an amateur, was a very tough and, and kind of hard-nosed professional at times. Um, uh, most of the time that, that didn't get them to any difficulties, but there was a game in 1957, they were playing Surrey at the Oval, uh, and uh, Peter May, the, 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 the then Surrey and England captain, was batting, and he hit the ball to mid-on where Dad was fielding, and the ball supposedly looked like it had been caught very low down on the ground. Um, Peter May uh, thought that Dad had taken the catch and started to walk to the pavilion. Um, Dad, being the player he was, turned towards the umpire and began to motion to say that he hadn't caught the ball. Wilf, being the player that he was, called to Dad to give him the ball and they threw it to Hayden Davis and they ran him out just to make doubly sure. Um, so uh, I think the thing I always remember that Dad saying about about Wilf was he, how important he felt having an all Wales team was, and and Dad was lucky enough I think to be in the the first team uh, that Glamorgan put out that was an an all Welsh football team and that was in 1955, and at the beginning of Dad's career most definitely Wilf was somebody who not only kind of you know told people what to do he also nurtured and, and encouraged them in playing the game. Uh, Wilf batted with Dad when he made his maiden first class hundred. They had a, a, a um, uh, they put on about 156 together against Sussex at Hove. Um, and yes, Dad's 
dad really, you know, really did look up to Wilf and, and, and respected him greatly. I'm going to bring in now uh, the various members of the Wooler family who are, who are with us this evening because uh, we've just heard about how hard a man Wilf Wooler was on the field. But what about off the field? What about Wilf Wooler, the family man? I don't know whether Brian, Nick or Jackie would like to share anything with us. I think we all probably would, um, Andrew. Dad was dad to us. And um, uh, the harder side to him that I think a lot of players saw certainly didn't, um, he didn't show to us. He was a big softy um, and was very proud of all we did. One thing he didn't ever do was push sport onto us. Um, he, he let us do, you know, guided us in whatever we wanted to do. And I was always very, very proud of his uh, sporting achievements and used to gladly admit when people said, you know, any relation to Will, I'd always be happily say yes, his daughter. I think the only time it did rankle a bit uh, was I went to Kinkoid Cardiff Teachers College and for most of my time there, I wasn't known as Penny, I was known as Will. <laughs> so that was slightly annoying. But he was a very loving father and very caring. And um, I know, I, th I think Jackie's got some memories as well of uh, the family down in, uh, in the Gower or, and uh, Caswell Bay. Well, no, the, the, I think one of the others is going to talk about C Caswell. Oh, yes. OK. Um, two things, leading on for what Penny said. Um, the contrast between, you know, Wilf Waller on the pitch, incredibly competitive and not averse to provoking the opposition um, in any way that he could. Uh, so different from when he was home. And he would often, you know, the opposing team players, they'd often get invited back to the house after the game had finished the following day or whatever. And of course, they were then captivated by our very beautiful and charming mother. But um, also, they, they could be quite surprised at the geniality of their host. And um, I just remember mum saying that once she, she, some one of, I think it was the captain of, sorry, I, I don't know why I think that, but that um, who said how surprised he was at how dad was at home. And she, he said, because he's a bugger on the field. <laughs> and uh, I, <laughs> I think there was a very big contrast. But the other thing is, Again, what Penny said, he was a wonderful father, but he was great fun. He had a fantastic sense of humour and he had a great sense of the absurd. And one story we used to love was that the county club in Cardiff, which a lot of a lot of the people listening to this are going to know, and it's a, it's a very popular hall then, and it's a huge Victorian building. And once upon a time, way back when, there was some problem with the plumbing and the mains were turned off and they filled the bath which John, my brother John, tells me is a big ornate bath. Women weren't allowed in the county club in those days. And they filled it with water, um, you know, because there was no running water. And so seeing this, Dad went over to the covered market, where in those days you could buy all sorts of livestock, bought a couple of goldfish, went back to the county club and surreptitiously released these goldfish into the bath. Then he just left leaving other people to ponder the mystery of how two goldfish had swum into the bath in the county club. And that's what, and it just tickled him, the idea of people going in, and I don't know whether he ever confessed, I don't know, but he just had such a wonderful sense of, of the ridiculous. He was, he was great fun. He really was great fun to be with. Yeah, I, did, I, I was just going to say that uh, I, I loved uh, the story that uh, Stephen just shared about um, Skipper. Um, and how he, how much he 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 thought of the team and, and uh, how they obviously thought a lot of him and whenever we were there, referred to as Skip or Skipper, um, as, as as Jackie and Penny said, he was just dad to us. Um, it, it, Morgan was a great love of his, and uh, in, in fact, my mum always used to say that uh, although she was the love of his life, uh, he always maintained. She always used to say that she. On a good day, she came in seventh on the pecking order, 
um, that was behind the five children and, and Anglomorgan cricket. And then sometimes it was eighth, depending on what dog we had at the time. Uh, he was larger than life to us uh, as well. And I always remember, as Jackie said earlier, about all the little kids who were actually our age at the time, waiting outside the St. Helens ground to get his autograph. And he always had time for them. Um, and he always had time for us and, and Glamorgan cricket. Well, you want me to, I, I got a couple of tales if, uh, for a moment. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm tail end Charlie, so I'm a few years later than uh, everybody else. But uh, I do remember when Dad was commentating once when we were down the caravan near Swansea. Um, and I must have been, this must be early 70s now. And he came back but dressed in his suit. And because the mackerel were shoaling, the first thing he did was go down and start fishing for mackerel off the beach in his suit. And mum was livid. <laughs> so that was one tale I always remember. And the other thing I didn't remember was I was going to college. We were talking about flying and dad says, oh, flying's easy. And I said, what the hell do you know about it? And he said, well, when we came back from the war, my mate Edgar Bibby wanted to go and collect some family from, uh, from Africa. So we basically stole a plane and flew to Africa. And I'm like sitting there going, what? <laughs> and they flew all the way across, uh, across uh, the ocean, of course, and they were fueling on small tracks with uh, you know, petrol stations. And uh, he, I, I was in my 20s before I found this out. So uh, he, he, was, he wasn't great on telling people the things he'd done. He was a bit reserved in that way. But he did give me two good bits of advice which have stuck with me all my life. And the first one was like, you fight like hell in your battle. And then afterwards, it's by a pint. It's, that's it. The battle is done. You just get on with life. And, that, and that's a great attitude to have, which I've learned and used hopefully in my life. And the best piece of advice he gave me, I think, was he said that um, during your life, you will meet people who will tell you things with great authority and it, you feel like you should accept what they say. He said, don't accept what they say, challenge it. If it stands up, that's great. If it doesn't, as quite often it won't, you will learn something and, and you were right to ask. Uh, and that's, that's probably the best bit of advice he's given me all my life. And um, great man, difficult one to follow. That's my dad. Well, thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, Nick, Nick, no, I've, got, I've got little to add to that, other than the fact that, um, just going back to Stephen's point and the photograph that's in front of us there, I, w I must have been nine years old. I'm just standing there um, watching the cricket by the where the entrance of the old Cardiff Arms Park ground. And there was a commotion on the field, and I didn't know what was going And then all of a sudden... Steve, your, um, your father came with his blood all covered in his face. It, a ball had just risen. It hit him in the face. And I thought, right, that's it. I'm not going to be a batsman. So <laughs> that was the end of that. But, I mean, the one thing that Dad taught me was, you know, to be fearless in a way. Because he kind of changed. You, you'd stand at silly mid-on. Dad would stand at stupid mid-on. And, and wouldn't bat an eyelid, and he'd just be there. So, you know, it was, um, yeah, a privilege. Well, having groomed a, a, a fantastic championship-winning team and a team, as we've said, who uh, whose several members had gone on to play for England, during the middle of the 1950s, Wilf was now grooming the next generation of Glamorgan players. And as we move towards the end of this evening's presentation we're just going to have a look at the new blood that Wilf brought in during the 1950s. Of course Emrys Davis the gentleman there on the right hand side of this photo a man whose county career with Glamorgan had begun way back in 1924. In 1954 Emrys's career came to a very sudden and dramatic end as Glamorgan met Northamptonshire at Peterborough. <coughs> Emrys was facing Frank Tyson, the very, very quick bowler. Emrys couldn't actually lay bat on ball. He returned to the pavilion and said, Skipper, that's it. I can't see the ball anymore. I'm finished. Emrys, known as The Rock, and Emrys subsequently retiring and becoming a first-class and test umpire. 
Well, amongst the new faces, Tony Lewis, who at the age of, well, yet to actually uh, have his 18th birthday, he'd had an outstanding career at Neath Grammar School, had played for Glamorgan second 11, and Tony also had an offer in the summer of 1955 to be a violinist in the Welsh Youth Orchestra. A letter, though, had arrived at Tony's home offering him a chance to play for Glamorgan against Leicestershire at the Arms Park. Of course, you never said no to a letter from Wilf, and Tony duly made his debut, and as we'll hear in our next talk in a month's time, went on to lead the Glamorgan team to the 1969 county title. Also in that 1969 championship winning team, another new face from the 1950s, Peter Walker. Peter had arrived in Cardiff in the mid 1950s, still a youngster working in the Merchant Navy. His father had played club cricket for Cardiff before the Second World War, had played alongside Wilf and also Johnny Clay. He'd, uh, Peter had also been coached by Emrys Davis and Alan Watkins whilst growing up in South Africa. So Peter, whilst visiting Cardiff as a young sailor, headed up to number six High Street to see if he could make contact with the Glamorgan players. Wilf saw him together with Johnny Clay and they arranged a net in the indoor school at the Arms Park and it wasn't long before Peter had agreed terms and had also become a Glamorgan cricketer. Now some people may wonder why I'm showing a, a photo now of Don Shepherd. He wasn't a new player in the mid-1950s, ah, but I suppose he does fit this category because as Mark said earlier, his father had begun life as a fast bowler, but Shep, on the advice of uh, Hayden Davis and others, had converted into an off cutter. Mark, I know the, uh, the summer of 1956 was a, a highlight for your father because after the advice from the senior Glamorgan players, about switching to off cutters. I know that in that summer of 1956, Shep took 168 wickets. Yeah, indeed, Andrew. I mean, he'd been a medium fast bowler and uh, had played for several years and indeed had taken 100 wickets in 1952. So he wasn't without success, but then there came I suppose a couple of barren years for him. You know, he absolutely loved the game, was a, a devout professional and wanted to do well. And he went through the 50s having 100 wickets in that season, but then it started to tail off. And then he thought on the advice of senior players, in particular Hayden Davis, who'd said he thought his wrist was suited to offspin. So he changed and he worked on it. And in 1956, he actually took 156 county championship wickets, 177 first class wickets. So obviously the advice of the professionals, the senior pros was superb. It, it had shaped him and it had shaped him to probably, well, to play for another... <laughs> 16, 17 years, Andrew. And I know that a lot of people uh, have said that there was no future really for a fast or a quick bowler bowling a lot on the on the slow pitches at Cardiff and the slow pitches at Swansea and the other grounds that Glamorgan uh, played. Let's not forget in, in these days, Glamorgan were playing up to 32 three-day games and the pitches were also uncovered. And in his new style, of course, Shep was lethal on the right surface. As you can see here in this, uh, in this photo, just confirming what Mark uh, was saying, this is Shep as a young fast bowler. We can see in the background, actually, Jim Police, who was also helping 
coach by this time. Uh, in the nets, these are the nets, the impromptu nets, as you can see in the very top left-hand corner, lighting along one of the corridors of the North Stand at Cardiff Arms Park. But when Shep switched to off-cutters, of course, as Mark said, he was lethal. And of course, he was the next bowler after Jim McConnon to have a fantastic rapport with the close fielders. We'll be talking more in the next talk about the victories over Australia in 64 and 68 at Swansea. And of course, those wonderful wickets as well. Court Walker, Bold Shepherd, 175 times that entry was made by the Glamorgan scorer. And I know in our next talk, Mark, I'm sure you'll be wanting to pay tribute to that ring of close catchers. Well, one of the other young players in the 1950s, another person to uh, play their first game for Glamorgan, a very young and a very youthful Alan Jones. And as I said at the start of this evening's talk, we're delighted that Alan is with us this evening. Alan, I gather that you actually made your debut for Glamorgan against the Australians of 1955 at Swansea. So Alan, tell us then, uh, you were sat with your family watching uh, your hero, Neil Harvey, play for Australia. Yeah, I was down at St Helens just watching the game because I'd only been on the staff um, a couple of years uh, and it, a couple of the players were got injured. Um, the 12th man was on and then uh, uh, Phil Thomas, who was secretary at the time, came on the mic and asking if there was any young player on the Glamorgan staff at the ground, would he come to the dressing room? And I went to the dressing room and I had to go on and field. And I had to borrow Bernard Hedges' kit, um, Bernard's boots, uh, trousers, shirt and everything. And the first ball I fielded at St. Helens was hit to me by the great left-hander, Neil Harvey. And that was the first time I ever went onto the first-class cricket field uh, to play for Glamorgan. It was quite an experience and one which I'll uh, always remember. What was it like, Alan? Um playing then as a youngster and making your championship debut later in 1957. What was it like uh, playing alongside these legendary figures in the world of Glamorgan cricket? Well, it was something very new to me, Andrew, because I'd only been on the staff um, two or three years. And my first game should have been against Hampshire at Swansea. But uh, there wasn't a ball bowled in, in that game. <clears throat> and then we went up to play uh, at Ebervale against uh, Gloucester, uh, Hampshire. And uh, there was only two days played at Ebervale. Uh, and eventually I got my first game uh, of first class cricket for Glamorgan at Bristol against Gloucestershire, um, where I got naught in the first innings and 11 in the second innings. And uh, finding out how difficult the game was uh, in, in those days, different conditions, no covers on the wickets. And um, obviously the wickets were doing quite a bit. <clears throat> and but, did, Wilf, did Wilf give you any, uh, any words of advice? Wilf was very helpful. He, he was a very hard man, as, as it had been said already, on the field of play, he was a very hard man to play against. But he, he wanted an all Glamorgan, uh, all Welsh Glamorgan side. That was his ambition. And uh, all of the young players at that time had a lot of respect for Will Fuller. Uh, he was a wonderful man, always prepared to help young, young players. And I'll never forget, because when I first started uh, playing uh, on, on the staff for Glamorgan. I wasn't a very good player of swing bowling. And I remember Ozzy Wheatley and Wilf taking me one side at the indoor school in Neath and just bowling at me for an hour and a half. 
respect and learning, teaching me how to play swing bowling. Uh, he was a, a brilliant uh, technician and um, one with, which I will I've always have happy memories of. Thank you, Alan, for those uh, those lovely words uh, about uh, about Wilf. Of course, it was Wilf who had helped the career of Bernard Hedges and Stephen, I believe, as well as Wilf helping Alan in his early years. Wilf helped your father as well, and it was Wilf who believed that Bernard could make a success of an opening batsman. Yeah, um, Dad only started opening the batting with Gilbert in 1957. And I suppose the first thing to say, that was seven seasons into his first class career. And I don't know if it was Alan's uh, uh, similar experience. But you almost had to serve an apprenticeship in first class cricket, sort of in the middle order and work your way up to the top <coughs> spots. Um, and although Glamorgan weren't recognised as a, as a batting side, I can certainly say that Parkhouse and Hedges at some moments um, were capable of, um, you know, dealing with the, the most difficult of, of uh, bowling uh, sides. Um, 1959 was perhaps the best example. Um, the context was very much the um, membership of county clubs had been dropping, attendances at games had been dropping, and the MCC was very concerned with something they mysteriously called brighter cricket. They wanted players to be more open and attacking in the way that they played. The batsmen were lucky that summer. It was a long, hot summer. There were 23 batsmen that scored over 2,000 runs in the season, 331 hundreds compared to 146 in uh, the previous season. Um, and there was a prize offered, uh, a 500 guinea prize, offered for the team that was fastest to 200 in their first innings. And Parkhouse and Hedges led the way for Glamorgan in, that, uh, in the fight for that prize. Um, uh, they played at, uh, Kent at Dartford uh, and uh, Dad and Gilbert put on 207 for the first wicket in just under three hours. Uh, and then at the next home game, they scored 140 in an hour and 45 minutes. Um, and they were only pipped sort of uh, 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 at the post, really, by the Warwickshire opening pair, uh, who, who, who beat the, the record late on in August. So 1959, uh, Glamorgan, uh, the Glamorgan opening pair were the best opening partnership in, in the county championship. So they had almost twice the number of runs that Brian Stott and Ken Taylor at Yorkshire got, um, more than Arthur Milton and Martin Young at Gloucestershire more than Bob Barber and Alan Wharton at Lancashire, uh, and, and more than a, a young John Edrich, who was 21 years old, and Mickey Stewart uh, at Surrey, who were the main opening pairs for them. Um, the thing I always uh, remember about Dad and Gilbert is the differences, though. Um, that summit must have been particularly obvious. Gilbert would often come back in from a very long innings and not have a bead of sweat on him, whereas Dad, I think, would used to come in ashen-faced with a with his hair splayed all over his all over his head, um, and the other thing, Dad was a non-smoker. He never smoked. Uh, Gilbert, I think, smoked everywhere. Um, people used to call them Benson and Hedges. Um, so, um, but it, I, I think there were times, there were moments when you know um, Glamorgan's batsmen really did shine, and 1959 was one of those. And of course, uh, 1959 saw Gilbert return to test cricket after uh, eight or nine years uh, in uh, uh, the, I suppose you could say, the international wilderness. Of course, Wilf by then had uh, become an England selector. Here he is in his new role on the balcony at Lords. We can see in the suit uh, uh, jacket, Doug Insole, and just to uh, the... Uh, left of Wilf, we can see a very young Norman Gifford, the uh, Worcestershire uh, uh, cricketer. Well, ev all good things come to an end, and by the late 1950s, there was a fair bit of talk about uh, who was going to be uh, the next Glamorgan captain, and who was going to take over the mantle of Wilf Wooler. I know that uh, Wilf uh, 
had also, uh, well, maybe unfairly. I know uh, Tony Davis is now going to uh, share uh, some stories with, uh, with Stephen Hedges' help. Um, Wilford, Wilford attracted some criticism, as I said, perhaps unfairly. A game in particular, Tony, at Hove against Sussex in 1956. I think you've got the stats there from uh, that game. Yes, um, Glamorgan, Glamorgan were playing Sussex and a, a gentleman by the name of Don Smith, who sadly passed away recently, who was the oldest test player in the country when he passed away. But he had a bit of a checkered career playing for Sussex. But on this particular day in 56, he opened the batting with Alan Oakman and they scored 241 for the first wicket. And, and Sussex went on to score well over 350 runs in their first innings. Uh, Don Smith was then asked to bowl later on in the day. And would you believe he took six for 29, bowling Glamorgan out for 64. Robin, Robin Marler, who was the captain of Sussex, obviously, invited Glamorgan to bat again. And I will pass over now to Stephen, who will conclude what happened. We've, we've heard about uh, Will's uh, team talks uh, before, and uh, the one that he gave before this second innings was a very brief uh, and to the point. He said, I don't want anybody playing any shots in this innings at all. And if I see anybody playing any shots, you'll be on the first train back to Cardiff. So Wilf decided to um, lead by example. So him and Gilbert went out to start the second innings. And uh, to his words, he didn't offer a shot to hardly anything. Um, Robin Marler used all 10 outfield uh, players to bowl. Um, it was... Uh, an incredibly slow run rate. The Sussex crowd started to jeer and boo. Uh, and at one point, apparently in the afternoon's play, Wilf sat down on the wicket and waited until the crowd had stopped booing before he continued his innings. Um, the following morning, the final day, uh, Glamorgan had to bat on. And we've heard a little bit about Wilf's humor. And I, I always love this little story. He's on his way out with, with Gilbert to bat again. Uh, and he says uh, to a few of the uh, Sussex members, good morning, gentlemen. I'll see you at the end of the session. Um, true to his words, Glamorgan finished that uh, innings 200 for one. The game was drawn uh, 200 for one off 138 overs. It was officially the slowest ever run rate in the history of county cricket. Um, I spoke to Don Shepherd, and Don said we had to be smuggled out of the back of the pavilion into taxis. Uh, Dad had gone into bat. G Gilbert had made a, 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 a committed a heinous crime of, of, of trying an off drive and had got caught. Um, when Dad and Wilf came back in, uh, the Sussex members were throwing their seat cushions at them both. Um, the Sussex committee, I believe, wrote to the Glamorgan committee after the, the match to complain. Um, but having said all of that, I was lucky enough to speak to Robin Marler um, uh, uh, two or three years back. And he used a lovely phrase. He says, well, really, it was all sounding brass and tinkling cymbals. A lot of fuss about nothing. He said, really, the problem was we never bowled them out. And that's what our job was to do. And so Wilf was quite right in saying, if a team cannot win a game, then they have to make sure they don't lose it. Uh, perhaps a lesson that uh, some of the England batsmen might need in the next couple of days. Indeed, Steve. And um, perhaps... When we continue this uh, this review of uh, of Glamorgan in the 1950s, we shouldn't forget as well that Wilf was the person who uh, had also consulted the tide tables at Swansea, wanting to see whether the tide was coming in or out, and consulting as well with uh, George Clements, the long-serving groundsman at St Helens, who would help to uh, give advice on whether they should bat or bowl. Well, Wilf's career... And, came... and, Andrew, Andrew, I've got a little bit of a story which 
leads on from that. And um, my father told me that the opposition skippers, when they played at Swansea, they never bothered to phone the um, the weatherman. They always phoned the the coast guard to check the tide times. Wow. So it was true then that the tide tables were in use. Absolutely. <laughs> Wonderful. Well. As I said, all good things come to an end. Wilf uh, decided to retire at the end of the 1960 season. Wilf uh, had by then over 12,600 runs to his name, 887 wickets and 391 catches. In that final season, uh, there is one further story that uh, is well worth sharing. It relates to a game at Rodney Parade in Newport, where Tom Graveney, batting for Worcestershire, ground out a, uh, a quite stodgy 200. He returned to the pavilion to uh, lots of applause from his teammates, but Wilf, in stentorian terms, let everyone know what he thought. And as Tom Graveney was walking up those steps at the Rodney P Parade Pavilion, Wilf said, that was the worst bloody 200 I've ever seen. Well, Wilf, as I said, retired from regular play in 1960. He became Glamorgan's full-time secretary and continued until 19. 77 and I think it would only be uh, right and proper to uh, finish tonight's uh, presentation if uh, we just heard from members of Wilf's family who are with us this evening about how proud they were of their father's achievements so I think Penny you're going to uh, start the uh, the final section of tonight by paying tribute to your father. Well, the, the, sorry, Andrew, I sort of did that before. <laughs> I thought, thought it was earlier on. No, as I said earlier, we were incredibly proud. He was dad to us. And it's been fascinating tonight listening to some of the stories and seeing the perspective of the, his players and the public's image of him because he was dad to us and as I said as I can show sure I can speak for the rest of the family immensely proud and very proud to admit that I was a relation to Will. Yeah well, oh, I think, I think Penny, Penny speaks, speaks for all of us there. So, <laughs> you might get my cat in the picture now because she's very interested in the um, he was yeah, he was just larger than life, and he was just he was great. He was great to be around. He was he was a a great a great dad, and we were very proud of him. And he was funny and fun, and we teased him unmercifully. And it was just it was great. They were great. He and Mum were great company. We we really spent a lot of time in our teens and our and our adult early adult times. We just spent a lot of time with them because it was one of the best places to be, to be honest, with the rest of my siblings, of course. Yeah, right. Sorry, this is the cat. Right. <laughs> if, if he's sitting up there on the cloud with mum saying, I'll have the other half of that, Edith, I'd just like him to be looking down at me, uh, trying to live my life, um, thinking of the way he lived his life. A uh, big act to follow. Love my dad. That's all I want to say. Yeah. yeah. Nick, you're on mute, so if you want to unmute yourself. It's funny that the older you get, the more you realise the wisdom of the people that passed before you. And it's, you know, I look back and I just think, what a privilege. You know, the kindness that was shown to me when I went in. I was, that's one thing that stuck with me, was the kindness of the players when, you know, tagging along behind Dad during the, during the games and so on and so forth. And... You know, that's just a reflection because I think Dad helped a lot of people on the way through and he was a very, very kind, goodly, godly guy. I 
just add to that, he was belligerent and opinionated, but we loved him for it. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> even when he was wrong, he was never actually incorrect. He was all, he was very fair. He was very fair, and I'm sure I'm sure the players he played with and Alan would would back us up on that. He was fair. he always had he always had your back, um, and and that as a as a family, uh, it was great to know he was always there for us when we needed. Absolutely. Loyalty is enormously important. Those are wonderful words to uh, finish uh, on. And uh, as uh, we look back this year in particular of uh, a year of hardship and uh, a year where hopefully uh, there is no light at the end of the tunnel, we, could, we can all possibly uh, empath empathise a little bit about uh, what Wilf would have suffered during the war and how much it meant for him to return to mould the championship winning team of 1948. And of course, even though he had uh, retired in 1960, I know Wilf was still very much in charge of Glamorgan cricket. He oversaw a wonderful decade in the 1960s he oversaw Glamorgan's victories against Australia in 64 and 68. Of course, mentioning 68, we mustn't forget as well that Wilf was there behind the microphone at St Helens on that day when Gary Sovers deposited uh, Malcolm Nash for six sixes and those wonderful words to the final ball and it's gone all the way down to Swansea Town Centre. Those words, of course, now in the archives of uh, sports history, it was Wilf who had persuaded the BBC producer to uh, stay on. They should have gone for a break, but Wilf had said, I think something's gonna happen. And a few overs later, those six sixes went in to the county records. Of course, Wilf was at the microphone in 1969, by now at Sophia Gardens, when, Wilf, when Glamorgan became county champions again. And it was in 1969 that Wilf was commentating when Tony Lewis lifted the championship trophy at Sophia Gardens. Of course, it was Tony who had been Wilf's choice as someone who would go on to lead Glamorgan with great success. Well, those are just some of the highlights for our next talk, which will be happening all being well on Wednesday, the 24th of March, when we'll be talking and reminiscing about the 60s and 70s. I'm just going to finish, though, with one final story about Wilf, which, in fact, came from Enid, Wilf's wife. Enid was an optometrist. Enid had worked for many years in an opticians in Cardiff. And during the 1960s, Wilf was actually working as a broadcaster and as a journalist on rugby. And Wilf was covering several of the rugby trials. In those days, of course, it was the probables against the possibles. And there was one player who'd been called up who unfortunately in the final Welsh trial, he didn't really do himself justice. Wilf wrote a rather scathing piece in the Sunday Telegraph. A few days later, the sports editor of the Sunday Telegraph sent Wilf the letter which the mother of this particular player had written to complain about the harsh words which uh, Wilf had used to describe her husband's play. She signed off the letter by saying, I think your correspondent, Mr. Wooler, needs to have his eyes tested. Of course, Wilf then dutifully sent a very well-worded and well-crafted uh, reply to the lady saying, I'm sure that your husband is a gifted player and actually on this occasion didn't do himself justice. And then, after signing his name, Wilfred Wooler, he put P.S. By the way, my wife 
is an optician and she assures me that my eyesight is very good. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we could go on and on with stories about Wilf, stories about the skipper and stories about Glamorgan cricket from the 1940s and 1950s. But as I said earlier, all good things have to come to an end. And it's uh, with much pleasure that I thank all of the contributors this evening, to Jackie, to Penny, to John, to Brian and Nick. Many thanks to all of you for your wonderful, wonderful stories and memories of your father. Also my thanks to Stephen Hedges, to Tony Davis, to Mark Shepherd, and of course, to Alan Jones, who we'll be hearing much more of in the next tour. Apologies for the technical problems we had earlier on, but we got through. And uh, we, of course, gritted our teeth, as Wilf would have wanted us to do, and to see it through to the end. My thanks to everyone for joining as well. Don't forget that we'll be having a talk with Matthew Elliott, the former Yorkshire, Glamorgan and Australian opening batsman. Matthew will be joining us on Saturday, the 6th of March at seven o'clock. But it only leaves me now to say Diochen Vaur. Thank you everyone for this wonderful evening of nostalgia and to once again to thank everyone for their contributions this evening. Many thanks. Good evening. Nostar. Thank you, Andrew. Well done. Thank you, thank you, thank Andrew. you Andrew. Thanks, Andrew. Well done, everybody. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye -bye, everybody. Take Good care. Night. Nice to see you all. Bye-bye. Thank, bye. bye. thank you very much, Andrew. Bye. See you soon. Thank you, thanks, Andrew. Andrew.